If you've watched the previous three episodes in this series, some pretty difficult questions concerning the established story of the deaths of Hitler and his wife have emerged from the two investigations launched by the Soviets in 1945-46. If we accept the findings of the Soviet autopsies of the burned bodies of the man and woman found buried in a shallow grave, where German witnesses claim the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun had been cremated and buried on the 30th of April 1945, the Soviet pathologists established that the woman had died based on hemorrhage around the heart, only caused when the person is alive from shrapnel injuries to her chest. Most of her teeth were missing, attributed to fire, though it is admitted that an open petrol fire cannot reach the substantial and sustained temperatures hot enough to destroy dentition. Lodged loose in the mouth of the corpse was a gold lower jaw dental bridge, identified as having been made for Ava Brown, one of a pair, but never having been fitted in her mouth, according to her dentist, Dr. Hugo Blaschke, and his dental assistant and dental technician. Also lodged in the mouth was a broken SS cyanide ampule, but the pathologist found no evidence of cyanide compounds in the brain, lungs or intestines, indicating that the person had been dead when the cyanide was crushed in the woman's mouth. Despite grave medical doubts, the original Soviet Medical Commission reported that based on the dental bridge and the cyanide capsule, the burned woman was Ava Brown. A subsequent Soviet investigation ordered by Stalin decided that the autopsy evidence showed that the theory of cyanide was a red herring, and the body was not Ava Brown's. Rather, based on the medical and witness evidence, it was a deliberate forensic fraud, probably perpetrated by the Germans for some reason. The identity of the burned male corpse also comes with some doubt, or at least the mode of death. Though the corpse's artificial dentition matched well with the known dentition of Adolf Hitler, no gunshot wound was found on the head, contradicting all the German witness statements concerning Hitler's supposed method of suicide. And a cyanide capsule was again found broken once in the mouth of the corpse, but as with the woman's body, no trace of cyanide compounds could be found in the brain, lungs and or intestines, ruling out cyanide poisoning as the cause of death. The autopsy also remarked that the left foot was missing, possibly having been amputated. Nonetheless, the first medical commission's identification of this corpse as Hitler's was based solely on the dental bridges, and attributed cause of death to cyanide poisoning and not gunshot wound. And again, the second Soviet investigation concluded that this body also bore the hallmarks of a forensic fraud, and the identification was in doubt. The third stage in the secret NKVD investigation to find and positively identify Hitler was to return to the crime scene, the place where Hitler had supposedly died, the Führer bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery Garden. But due to Soviet bungling and disorganization, they had not properly investigated the Führer bunker when they captured it intact in May 1945. Instead, the NKVD tried to conduct a forensic investigation a year later, when much had changed or been lost. When the Red Army had captured the Führer bunker on the 2nd of May 1945, only one living soul remained in residence, the master electromechanic Johannes Henschel, who kept the pumps, the electric lights, and various other systems functioning in the bunker, also supplying power next door to the Reich Chancellery cellars and bunkers which were being used as casualty stations and emergency hospitals. Soviet Schmiersch personnel thoroughly searched the upper and lower bunker for intelligence material, and access to the underground complex was supposed to be restricted. However, after Schmiersch concluded its investigation and left, many people subsequently gained entry to the bunker by bribing Soviet guards, usually with cigarettes or alcohol, and a fair amount of looting was undertaken. The Soviets did not keep the bunker's U-boat diesel generator functioning, causing a loss of power to the lights and most importantly to the pumps, used to prevent water from flooding the lower bunker, which due to Berlin's high water table was a problem. This meant that the lower bunker where Hitler had lived and was reputed to have died was soon partially flooded with dirty water and mould began to flower on walls and furniture. 
Some of the best witness evidence from within the Führer bunker following its capture comes not from the Soviets, but from British and US sources. John McCowan of British Military Intelligence made two trips to the bunker in 1945, the second occasion in the company of a Russian-speaking British officer, after bribing the Soviet guard with a carton of cigarettes. McCowan was on a mission ordered by his boss, Colonel Dick White, to try and establish what had happened to Hitler. Shortly afterwards, war photographers from Life magazine managed to get into the bunker as well, the images they took showing the disorder, flooding and tumult even in July 1945. Parts of the upper bunker were fire damaged as well. Hitler's bodyguards had done this before breaking out on the night of the 1st to 2nd of May 1945. Hitler's conference room, the scene of his last stressful attempts to organise the relief of encircled Berlin, was by now a complete mess. The floor was strewn with papers and rubbish, the furniture thrown around, with a reading lamp and a telephone still present, as well as a sofa. No blood was noted in this room by Colonel McCowan or the American life photographers. In Hitler's bedroom, a stolen 16th century Italian painting of the Madonna and Child was still present. Hitler's safe had been opened by Schmirsch using acetylene cutters, its door left hanging open at the foot of Hitler's single bed. The mattress from the bed was missing. However, both sets of Western Allied investigators noted a dark blood stain on the bed's wooden side frame where blood had trickled down from the now missing mattress. Neither party noted blood on the floor, which was awash with dirty water. In the Führer's sitting room, the sofa, where Hitler allegedly had shot himself, was still there, and some bloodstains were noted on the right armrest, the left if you're looking at the sofa from head on. This had dribbled down to the sofa's frame. The British and American observers saw no visible bloodstains on the wall behind the sofa, as could be expected if someone had shot themselves in the head with a semi-automatic pistol. Also, no bloodstains could be discerned spread about on the floor, which was also strange as, according to witnesses, when Hitler was found, he was found slumped forward on the right side of the sofa with a bullet wound in his right temple, and his pistol lying on a rug on the floor. Though, to be fair, the SS witnesses claimed that this blood-stained rug was later rolled up and taken to the garden and burned alongside the corpses. The room was also awash with stagnant water when the Allied investigators gained entry. However, both groups did notice some blood-stains on the floor immediately under the right arm of the sofa. When the Soviet investigators subsequently pulled the sofa apart, it was evident that the amount of blood on it was fairly small. A limited, relatively slow blood loss, dripping to form two separate congealed pools with clear-cut edges trickling down on the material and the floor. Some experts have suggested that such blood loss and pooling was more consistent with a cut wrist than a gunshot to the head. Colonel McCowan thought it likely that Hitler had been shot while lying on his bed and someone else had been killed on the sofa. Incredibly, the Soviets actually permitted some official, though limited, investigation of the garden outside the Führer bunker by representatives of the Western Allies on the 11th of December 1945. Using German prisoners, the Western Allies oversaw some digging operations, particularly where the Soviets claimed to have found Hitler's body. Two of Hitler's uniform caps were found, a piece of underwear inscribed with Ava Brown's initials, and some paper files to Hitler from Dr. Goebbels. But then the Soviets closed the site the following day, accusing the Western Allies of removing documents from the Reich Chancellery. During the May 1945 Soviet autopsies of the corpses of the burned man and woman, tests had revealed each person's blood type, but the NKVD report subsequently suppressed this information for some reason. Clearly, by May 1946, the NKVD wanted to find evidence of Hitler's suicide in the bunker, as the established story told them by all the witnesses went, and they organised a bizarre forensic investigation a year too late. 
Heinz Linger, Hitler's suspicious SS valet, was brought from prison in Moscow to take part. On the 14th of May 1946, Linger was taken down to the dank, dark and mouldy lower bunker, to Hitler's sitting room, and told to outline exactly where all the furniture had originally been positioned at the time of Hitler's death. The NKVD had already spent some time recovering as much of the bunker's furniture as they could and putting it back in the various rooms. NKVD scientists then carefully measured the positions of all the objects in Hitler's sitting room and took samples of ticking and material from both the sofa and the bed in Hitler's bedroom, and also scrapings from the wall behind the sofa. The blood on the sofa and on the bed were the same, blood group A2. Adolf Hitler's blood group was A, as recorded in Dr. Theodor Morell's examination of Hitler on the 9th of January 1940. The NKVD did not mention any blood found from the wall scrapings, which probably would have been compromised anyway by the amount of black mould that was growing there. This new information further cast into doubt the Hitler pistol suicide theory, and mention of the blood on Hitler's bed was quietly ignored by the Soviets subsequently. Instead, the NKVD wanted the burned corpses to be forensically re-examined. The bodies, back in their Red Army ammunition crates, had actually been buried in the grounds of Magdeburg Hospital, within the Soviet zone of occupation, where, coincidentally, Schmersch had its headquarters. The Schmersch leadership was still smarting from having its original report on Hitler's death and identification rubbish by the Operation Myth NKVD investigation, and was in no mood to cooperate. However, an order was transmitted from Soviet Berlin Commandant General Siniev to the chief of Berlin Buch Hospital to prepare a post-mortem room for the examination of the dead bodies. Schmersch dragged its feet regarding releasing the bodies for examination, culminating in Lieutenant General Zelenin, head of Red Army Counterintelligence in Germany, refusing to do so. Though the bodies were not produced, the chief NKVD pathologist reviewed the reports again and concluded that both corpses had had cyanide ampules placed in their mouths, but that neither had actually died of cyanide poisoning. Also, no evidence of a gunshot wound had been found on either corpse. The NKVD report concluded, quote, the enigma of the cyanide capsules can be explained by the placement of the cyanide capsules into the mouths of the bodies of two corpses substitute of Hitler and Eva after they were probably shot. End quote. In the opinion of the NKVD, the corpses appear to have been dressed up forensically to appear to be Hitler and Eva, an evidence of a probable suicide method planted on them both. But how could the NKVD claim the people had been shot? Well, you might be familiar with this object. Tune in next time as the Soviets return to the gravesite and make new and disturbing discoveries. Will this finally prove the death of Adolf Hitler? Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.